one moment and we will get after it today. Bear with me. I got to put this live on YouTube for one of our teams that again is meeting in the classroom and for some reason cannot get their Zoom to work. All right. So we are here. Good. Everybody, thanks for being here. I'm going to spotlight my video and we'll get this party started. All right. So if you would, please go ahead and open up the chat. And if you could open up the chat, I'd like for you to go ahead and post uh, in there uh, any questions that you have for today so we can get started with those questions. And also, if you happen to have a chance to be on our call that we just did with Sean Casey, uh, Sean is a, a career 300 hitter over 10 years in Major League Baseball. He is... Uh, an MLB network analyst, and one of the best guys I've ever been around when it comes to the mental game. And if there's a video that I want you all to have, and I want you to add this to your habit share to watch once a week, I just posted a link inside of the chat. And it's basically a piece where Sean is on the MLB network, and he's talking about, I'm trying to manage this here, hang on. He's talking about all aspects of the mental game of hitting. And I think if you can take that and you can watch that video once a week, what that's going to do for you is that's going to give you the opportunity to better understand the mental game of hitting. So again, questions that you have related to this week's topic or any questions that you have related to any of our previous weeks, please go ahead and post them inside of the chat. And what I'm going to do here is go in and pull our notes for today's call where we're going to talk about pillar six, meditation and mental imagery. And we're going to unpack that today because I think meditation and mental imagery is a place where uh, you as a baseball softball player can get a huge significant advantage. I think you can get a huge bump in your confidence. I think it's a part of preparation that a lot of athletes aren't even aware of what it is. And I'm talking about not just athletes at the high school level, but I'm working with one of the women, uh, a, a world champion in the UFC right now and had no idea what mental imagery and visualization was and how that build that into to, uh, her preparation, getting ready for a fight. Talking about uh, NFL place kickers and how they would visualize a kick sometimes before they would make it but, or take the kick, but not all the time. Or golfers on the PGA Tour and how inconsistent they are with seeing the shot before they hit it. So one of the things that I think is is the easiest, let's call it, mindset to, to bring into the mental game of pitching. I picked up from a guy named Bob Tewksbury, and Tewks wrote the book 90% Mental, one of my favorite mental game books ever written. He's been the mental performance coach for the Red Sox, the Cubs, the San Francisco Giants. Tewks uh, pitched in a major league all-star game. He finished second in the Cy Young voting one year. And when his career was done, he went back to go get a master's in sports psychology. And he said the thing that helped him the most as a pitcher was to say it and to see it. And he would say when he would come set with a pitch, he would say what he was trying to do, fastball in, and he would see it. And if you've watched the game, you know, you know, they have like the pitch tracker, and here's the motion of the ball, and here's the slider, and here's the cutter, and here's the curveball, and here's the fastball. And it shows kind of like the red line, right, and where the pitch is going. So he would say, I would try to see the ball going where I wanted to throw it. I would say the pitch name, and then I would see it. I've also seen one of the top pitching coaches in, in the world, in my opinion, Ron Wolforth down at the Texas Baseball Ranch. And one of the things that they would do is he would have the pitcher with no ball in his hand just come out to a place where their release point would be. They'd put a string around their finger, about a 60-foot, 60 62-foot string, right? So the catcher would be able to grab it. And they literally would say, this is, this is where we want to throw the ball. So the string's going from the release point of their fingers, boom, to the inside part of the plate. And the catcher would move it to the outside part of the plate. And then they might move it letter high. And they might move it down. And they would just see like the line of the ball, literally with a string going from the hand to home plate. And that helped them to visualize the pitch. So tonight we're going to talk about meditation and mental imagery and another great book. I know we've got Austin Merrill and other, other some coaches on here that are super into the mental game that want to do this for a living. And my goal is to share with you the resources that you are going to want to crush to make sure that you're as prepared to do this at the major league level as Zach Sorensen is, who's on our call here tonight with the head of mental performance with the Atlanta Braves. One of the books I recommend is The Way of Baseball by Sean Green. And Sean Green would talk about how he would go to a T. And Sean Casey just talked about this in a coaching matters uh, hour call that we just did, which I'll make sure I send the link to you is he talked about, they would go to the T and they would hit and they'd get themselves into a meditative state, like literally just meditating going, okay, balls on the T come and set 
looking up at where the pitcher would be, visualizing a pitcher, a couple waggles, wham, and they would go. And I had a chance uh, one year, I was working with the USC Trojans, and it was the first weekend of the year in college baseball. And Albert Pujols happened to be there taking batting practice, and you Darvish was throwing a bullpen at the same time at SC. It was crazy. And uh, Albert Pujols went into the cage to hit to get warmed up. So naturally, I was there, and me and a bunch of the players go watch him in and watch him hit. And it was like med- it was like watching a guy with a moving meditation. And if you've ever done yoga and you get into it, it's a moving meditation. And that was him. He had a, he had a strength coach or somebody with him who would put a ball on a tee, and Albert would look at his bat. <sighs> then he would kind of come set, right, like he would here, and whack. And he, if he hit 60 balls, he put 50 of them into, a, uh, into what would be a shoebox in the back right corner of the, of the batting cage about knee high, just into the moment and into what he was doing. So I think there's ways that we can create that kind of a moving meditation. For me, it's why I like the ultra endurance running. It's why I like swimming. It's why I like cycling because it's like meditative. I'm, I'm moving, but I'm not really thinking. I'm active, but I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. So I, that's how part of the reason why I fall in love with those things. Golf is the complete opposite, right? I'm thinking about everything that goes in where my hips, my hands and all that stuff are. So with meditation, when we talk about meditation, it's the typical classic, like six to eight breath or the five by five box. So let me teach you two meditation techniques. They're like the only meditation techniques that I teach. I teach a couple other ones, but 80% of the time I teach these two. And most of the time I teach just the six to eight breath. Now, there's apps that I'd recommend if you want to get deeper into meditation. The Calm app, tremendous. Headspace, tremendous. Waking Up by Sam Harris. All of those are great, but they're not baseball specific. And all those are expensive. But no, I shouldn't say expensive. All those have an expense. So you have to pay for them. The 628 and the 5x5 five five are going to be free. Let me walk you through them. So I want you to imagine you have a triangle made up between the tip of your nose and the corners of your mouth. Okay, And if you close your eyes, don't do this if you're driving. But we, if you close your eyes, And you just inhale for a count of six, hold for two, and then exhale for eight, keeping all of your awareness and attention on that triangle as you inhale, breathing nice and deep through your nose for a count of six, hold for two, and then exhale for eight, in for six. Hold for two, exhale for eight, one breath at a time. And if you get distracted by a sound, by a smell, by a thought, by the past, by the future, just bring it back to that triangle. And if you can sit, start with maybe three breaths without getting distracted, move to five, move to seven, move to 10. Keep it at 10. And if you can sit and just focus on that six to eight breath, one breath at a time, that's going to allow you to develop a better f- ability to focus. It's going to allow you to be present. So that's your six to eight breath. Now, if you go ahead and open up your eyes, let me teach you another one. It's called the five by five box breath. So if you imagine a box with five on each side of the box, I picked this up from a former Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL commander named Mark Devine in his book, The Way of the SEAL. And he talks about when you're underwater as a seal and you're on this scuba mission and you're down there and there's sharks and there's, you know, ships that are super loud. You're trying to put an explosive on, like you have to be in control of yourself. And if you're taking down notes, I'd encourage you to write this. You have to be in control of yourself before you can control your performance. You have to be in control of yourself before you can control your performance. And the number one way to be in control of yourself is to breathe. So if you imagine, go ahead now and imagine just inhale for five, hold for five, exhale for five, hold for five. So let's take three of those breaths. So go ahead and inhale, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five. And now on your own, get two more of those.
All right, there you go. You just learned two meditation techniques, the two meditation techniques that I teach all of the clients and athletes I work with. And those are the two because you can make them, you can make those two meditation techniques as easy as you want them to be in a quiet, controlled environment. You can make them chaotic. You can make them chaotic and add stimulus and stress by sitting in front of a TV, doing it somewhere maybe in public uh, where there's noises and things you cannot control. You could do it sitting in cold water or in a cold shower. You could do it sitting in a hot tub, sitting in a sauna, whatever that adversity is for you, that's good practice at you getting present. Okay, so that's the meditation. Now, when we talk about mental imagery, let's first take a look at our notes here and, and learn a little bit more about what mental imagery is and why, why it's effective. And I'll walk you through some of the uh, audios that I've created for you so you can start to do mental imagery practice on your own. And for the coaches that are here, uh, I'd encourage you to understand two things. One, understand the mental imagery process that we follow. I took this out of a book called The Sixth Tool by Jack Curtis. Yeah, Sixth Tool by Jack Curtis. Everybody talks about the five tools of baseball, the six tools of mental game. And then Zach Sorensen, who's an MPM certified coach and on this call with us, Zach, thanks for doing this with me. Um, he's a mental coach for the Atlanta Braves. And Zach called me and said, Kaner, your four-step mental imagery, just call it ball. It'll be a much easier for people to remember. So we're going to walk through the ball mental imagery process, which is what I use. It's what Zach uses. It's what the world champion Braves use. Here we go. So we're, today we're talking about pillar six meditation and mental imagery. And whether we're aware of it or not, the mental images that we create and carry around, both the positive and the negative, have a direct impact on our physical and mental performance in baseball. When you begin to train the skill set of mental imagery and meditation, you will notice that you're better able to stay calm under pressure, focus and compete one pitch at a time on the field and one task or one block at a time off the field, rather than get caught up in the past or the future. Also, let me, let me share this with you, right? Right now, in, 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 in baseball, I see a lot of players that come to me and, and the parents will call and say, hey, could you work with my kid? I said, well, what's the biggest challenge you're seeing? Why do we want to get started? And you're saying he has a lot of performance anxiety. Or he can't get over a mistake. Holds on to the past. Now, if somebody who is a big hold on to the past player, right? If I struck out once, I'd, I'd use that to motivate me for 10 games. And it probably didn't help me as much as I thought it was. Here's what I would share with you. If you'd write this down, this might be one of the, one of the more enlightening things that we say today is that anxiety comes, performance anxiety comes from an obsession with the future, trying to control a future you can't control, especially in this game. Depression comes from a past that you can't do anything about. You can't go back, rewind time and change it. All you can do is learn from it. Optimal performance comes from being obsessed with the present. So obsession with past is depression. Obsession with future is anxiety. Obsession with right here, right now is where optimal performance comes from. So know where you want to go and then have your reverse engineered plan back to how you're going to get there. So when you, when you develop one of the best tools you can use to increase confidence through an advanced form of preparation, seeing it happen first in your mind, that none of your competition is using because they don't have a simple process to do it. We call that ball. I'm going to give you that same process that the Braves use. So you can do it easily on your own. So here it is, right? Here's your drill for today. Four steps to mental imagery. You're going to breathe. You're going to affirm. You're going to look back and you're going to look forward. So I'm going to have, I'm going to take you through this. You're going to breathe. You're simply going to do a six to eight breathing exercise. You're just going to six to eight breathe. Affirm or self-talk training is saying things to yourself, right? That you'd want to say. So we'd all benefit as baseball softball players by saying things like this. So I'm going to show, I'm going to role play for you here. I'm going to say something. I want you to say it to yourself. We'll say each one three times, but say it with a strong, committed internal voice. Here we go. I compete one pitch at a time. I compete one pitch at a time. I compete one pitch at a time. I control what I can control and let go of what I can't. I control what I can control and let go of what I can't. I control what I can control and let go of what I can't. I carry myself with big body language and confidence. I carry myself with big body language and confidence. I carry myself with big body language and confidence. 
So that's affirmation, self-talk training. If you, if you could say those to yourself, if you could control what you can control, compete one pitch at a time, and carry yourself with big body language and confidence, you're going to play better. And if you don't do those things, you're going to play worse. So when you're affirming things to yourself, meaning affirm means repeat what I want to happen. Repeat the mindset I want. A lot of us affirm the negative. Don't strike out. Don't walk the leadoff hitter. Don't fall behind in the count. Instead of telling yourself what you want to do. So affirm what you want, okay? After you breathe and you do your affirmation statements, your self-talk training, you're going to look back at your previous success. So I might say something like this. If you go ahead and close your eyes, I want you to look back now at your career. Don't do this if you're driving, but I want you to look back at your career in the movie theater of your mind. I want you to replay that highlight video of your best baseball performances. Go back to whenever that is. I'm 43 years old. When I was 17, I played in an all-star tournament in Massachusetts. And I'm at that game right now at Harvard when I came out of the bullpen and, and played my best. Right? So you can call these images back even 25, 30 years later like that. So I want you to go back to a moment in time when you were playing your best. See what it looked like. Feel what it felt like. Hear what it sounded like. Put yourself in that moment. And now I want you to see it as if you're looking out of your own eyes. So you're on top of the rubber. You're in the batter's box. You're playing your position defensively, seeing it out of you as if you were there in your body in that moment. We call this internal imagery. And now I want you to watch it as if you're looking at it on TV, whether it's from behind home plate cam or center field cam or side cam, wherever. And we often do imagery like this, like we're watching it on a camera because we watch so much video. We call this external imagery. So see yourself in those moments when you were at your best, what it looked like, what it felt like, what it sounded like. All right. And then come back and join me here. Now, how many of you by a show of hands, as I get to take a look at everybody here, how many of you by a show of hands, when you did your imagery right there, you actually went back and forth between like internal, external sometimes. How many guys were doing that? Right. That's totally normal. And there's some, there's some, there's some academics that would say like this type of imagery is better than that type of imagery. In my experience in doing this for the last 20 years, just do imagery. I don't care if you're doing an internal. I don't care if you're doing an external. I don't care if you see it forwards, if you see it backwards, just do imagery a little, a lot. I'm not going to get caught up in his internal or external. I would say if you're really interested and into it, do both, do both. And then Kat Osterman for our softball players, Kat Osterman was a four-time All-American pitcher at the University of Texas, arguably the greatest softball pitcher ever. And if you're a softball player on here and you've not listened to my podcast with, with Kat Osterman, search for it, please, and listen. And Kat talked about how she threw a pitch as a softball pitcher called a, called a drop ball. And she felt like she lost her drop ball one time. I mean, how many pitchers here have ever had periods where like, you just can't find your curveball or slider or change up, whatever it is, right? And she's like, and I lost it and I couldn't get it back. And then I started to work with Ken Revisa, my mentor, whose face I have tattooed in my heart, who created the book, The Mental Game of or the Heads Up Baseball, basically created the system that we're talking about, the 10 pillars. And she said, when I was working with Ken, because I had started with him with Team USA, he's like, one day in the bullpen, he goes, hey, Kat, I want you to go through and do a shadow bullpen, which we're going to look at. And I want you to see the ball backwards, see the ball from the catcher's glove, the break out of the catcher's glove back into your hand and then throw it then see it backwards and throw it and then bring it backwards. And she's like, at the time I thought it was kind of weird. And then, you know what? Like two days later I had my drop ball back. So she's like, when I shadow, sometimes I go forward. Sometimes I go backwards. Sometimes it's internal. Sometimes it's external. And you play with the image, right? The next L after we look back is we look forward. So if y'all go ahead and close your eyes, I want you to now look forward to your next performance. And as you look forward to that next competition, whatever that is for you, and as you look forward to that next competition, I want you to see yourself playing the way you want to play. Let's take yourself from the on-deck circle with a hand on the barrel. And as you're walking to home plate, you're walking like you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof, positioned your body with confidence, ready to compete. You get to home plate. You clean out the batter's box, whether at, at your home field, whether that's dirt, whether that's turf. And as you clean out that batter's box, you feel the dirt underneath your feet. You hear the dirt underneath your feet, underneath your spikes with your hand on that barrel and your dominant hand ready to hammer a baseball or softball. You step out of the box. You take that one practice swing. You look at the label on your bat. You take that full deep breath. 
you get in the box. And now you're going to get a fastball up that you hammer a line drive right back up the middle for a base hit. See, feel, and hear what that would be like. And as you do that, that's mental imagery. So here's what I want you to do. Okay. In this program, we, 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 this is not a speech. This is a system. And you have habit share on your phone. So I want you to add in habit share six to eight breath meditation. I want you to add in habit share mental imagery. And I'm going to walk you through mental imagery here live, but more importantly than what we do here live, I want you to have an audio that you can use that you can go back to. Now, some, some players I work with, they don't like doing imagery with an audio. They'll sit there. If they're in the dugout, they might put a towel over their head, close their eyes, visualize. Some might do it when their head hits the pillow. I remember when I was coaching at Cal State Fullerton, 2002 and three, George Horton would come in every day at the end of practice. He'd say, hey, guys, remember tonight when your head hits the pillow, replay practice. He said that at the end of every single practice for two years. Hey, tonight, when your head hits the pillow, replay practice. And what he was saying was tonight as a player, and you guys should and gals should be doing this. When your head hits the pillow, replay that day's performance, but go back and replay your positives. So let's say you had 25 pitches in BP and you squared up five of them, replay those five. You threw a bullpen, you executed 10 out of 20 pitches, replay the 10 you executed. Let go of the negative, reinforce the positive. So let me share some audios with you. If you open up the chat here, and as I put these in the chat, I want you to click on them and open them up in your YouTube browser. So the first one is hitting imagery. Okay, so if you click on that, that's going to open up in YouTube. Just bookmark or save that audio. You can do this before you go to bed. The next one is pitching imagery. Kind of talk and type at the same time. Next one is baseball team imagery. So the college teams that I'm working with, whose season just started, one of the head coaches said, hey, we want to do mental imagery tonight in the hotel. Could you jump on a Zoom with us? And I said, I'll do you one better. I'll make an audio and put it on YouTube that you can listen to every single night. And you don't have to be in the same room. You can give it to your team to do on their own. He goes, well, I like having my team in the same room. We do it when we do our bed checks. So great. So when you do your bed checks and you bring your team in and you talk about the game today and who you're going to face tomorrow, have them bring pillows, lay them down on the ground, finish with baseball team imagery. Softball players. I'm going to post that here too. Softball imagery. And I literally made all of these within the last, <laughs> within the last two or three weeks. And this is what I do currently. So if you were to work with me one-on-one -on -one and you were to come to the house and sit in this chair right here and have me take you through mental imagery, now it would be custom for you, but it's going to follow exactly this four-step plan. So for, for Austin, Chris Andrews, right? Chris and Scott and other coaches we have on here, Zach Sorensen, that are into the mental game and want to do this for a career, this is exactly how I would do mental imagery if I were working with the Atlanta Braves. I'd follow the same four-step process. So when you listen to these audios, just be aware, okay, this, this is ball, breathe, affirmation, look back, look forward. And if I were making it specific for you, I'd ask you for what your affirmation statements are. I'd ask you for what you do when you look back, tell me your best performances. So I wouldn't say go back to your best performance. I'd say, Jake Martin, go back to that game where you had three doubles and 10 punch outs when you were pitching against Central. Boom, and you'd go back there and you'd kind of replay that, right? Whatever that specific is for you. And I'd say, look forward. How do you want to play? I want to be big. I want to be aggressive. I want to be locating fastballs in. I want to be able to throw my breaking ball in the dirt uh, because this is a breaking ball swinging team. We'll get a lot of strikeouts that way. So I would talk you through that. So you have those four imagery audios. You can do the 628 on your own. Before I take you through imagery, let me show you a shadow bullpen. Okay. So here's a mute that shadow bullpen. So they'll do this every single day. And in, in the programs I work with, well, they'll throw a, bit, a bullpen with no ball. Well, what am I working on when I throw a bullpen with no ball? Well, I'm working on visualizing the pitch. I'm working on taking my deep breath. As Bob Tewksbury 
said in his book, 90% mental. I'm going to say it. I'm going to see it. So what's he doing here? He's seeing the pitch and he executes. Now he just threw his last warm-up pitch. So he's going to get the ball back. And now he's going through his routines. So for the coaches on the call, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be doing shadow bullpens like this. You know, even if your hitters, or your pitchers face three guys a day, it should take five minutes. It's five minutes, maybe 10 max. If you can do these every day as a station, great. That's going to help them with their routines, with their breathing, with their visualization, with their self-talk. From a hitting standpoint, we can do what I call mental at bats. So we understand what a shadow bullpen looks like here, right? He's taking his breath, executing the pitch. Let's now go through and let me show you what a mental at bat looks like. So here's a mental at bat. So when I'm not playing, I'm not in the lineup that day. What do I do to stay prepared? Well, again, you've seen this clip before. This is TCU against Wichita State. Here's a player here, Ryan Johnson. If you take a look, his eyes are closed. What is he doing? He is visualizing the pitch. He just saw this guy throw. He's closing his eyes and seeing himself do damage to that ball. So now in this case, this guy's not in the lineup, okay? So he's, the, so let's say, the backup center fielder. So the person who's hitting is the center fielder. And when the center fielder on TCU is up as the backup center fielder, he's taking mental at-bats. That is his trigger to take mental at-bats. Now, if you saw the whole dugout, this is what he would do if he was four people away. So when our at-bat routine starts, as I'm four people away, I'm doing this in the dugout. It looks just like this. Then I'm, on, then I'm in the hole. Then I'm on deck. Then I walk big to home plate. I take possession of the box and I go to battle one pitch at a time. So this is a mental lab app. Classic story. Okay. College baseball opening weekend, two weekends ago, I get a call from a player at Texas A&M. He goes, Kaner, man, I'm not playing the way I want to. I feel like everything's speeding up on me. I'm like, good. We're two games in the season. <laughs> this is normal. Uh, I said, well, have you been started? He goes, I started game one. I didn't play it all in game two though. So, okay, well, what'd you do in game two when you didn't play? Did you sit on the bench and feel sorry for yourself or did you get prepared? He goes, no, I took mental at bats every time. I said, all right, but you still felt rushed in, on Friday night in game one. He says, yeah. I said, all right, well, what are we going to do about it? Let's come up with a, with a plan. I said, tomorrow, when you do go do your early work, I said, I want you to really feel cleaning out the batter's box. Feel the dirt under your feet. Hear the dirt under your feet. And he goes, man, that's good. I'm not doing that. That's going to get you present. Because remember, you don't hear the, the past or the future. You hear the present. You don't feel the past or the future. You feel the present. So he cleans the box, hears it and feels it. And then he uh, uh, doesn't start on Sunday, takes his four mental at bats. And in the ninth inning, where their team down four to three against Fordham on Sunday, he leads off the inning with a double. Next guy hits a home run, they win. Pinch hit double they win. And it was really cool to talk to him afterwards. Just saying, he goes, man, I felt like hearing the dirt and feeling the dirt and then really being aware of my, my breath and finishing it really slowed me down. So the game knows if you guys would write this down, especially the players, the game knows the game of baseball is bigger than all of us. Like it's going to be here at your school long after your coach retires long after you, you you're done playing long after none of us are kicking on this earth. Still, guess what? The game of baseball is still going to be here and it's still going to be played in your town. It's still going to be played at your school. So we're a part of it. The game is bigger than all of us. And the game knows. And the game rewarded this player at Texas A&M with a base hit in the ninth inning and a pinch hit opportunity because he was prepared. Look, the game and success rewards those who are prepared. Separation is in preparation. And mental imagery and meditation are a form of preparation that you can use to give you the best chance for success that your opponents don't even know exists. So use it to your advantage. But like everything else we talk about here, if you don't use it, you will lose it. So those imagery audios that we posted, the, the, the shadow bullpens, the mental at bats, the six to eight breathing, it's worthless if you don't use it. It's a game changer if you use it consistently. Great question comes in here from Cruz. Cruz said, how would you go through the mental imagery process in a big at bat or situation? I'd say, Cruz, every at bat is a big situation. Look, the one thing that I think is a biggest mindset shift for you from a high school player to get to the next level in college or professional is there is no step up. You do not step up. You sink to your training. So if it's a big situation in a big game 
and you haven't been visualizing all year, don't start now. It's like if you go, if you're going to play in, in the in the state championship and you've been eating McDonald's French fries and hamburgers all year, eat McDonald's and French fries and hamburgers going into the state championship. Don't make some big nutritional or some big preparation change because it's a quote unquote big game. They're all big games. Why? Because you're playing in it. And if I were working with you one on one, I would text you this before almost every game. I'd say, hey, get ready. Today's the biggest day of your life. Why? Because you're living it. Today's the biggest game of your life. Why? Because you're playing in it. What makes it big? That you're in it. What makes it big? That it's the next one. And the past is the past. And the future is a mystery. And there's nothing you can do about it. So treat this at bat. Treat this pitch. Treat this game. Inner squad scrimmage. Inside of the gym at Portage Northern. Or outside state championship. Play it how you would play it if it was the World Series. Biggest game because it's the next one. Let me show you an example. Andrew Baxter, who's the men's lacrosse coach at Fairfield University. He was a national championship winning lacrosse coach at Yale. Listen to his post-game, post-game interview on the field after they win the national championship. Right. There's so much goodness in this mental game. I know it's the cross, but bear with me. He said, how did it all unfold? He goes, I don't even know, Terry. You want to know why he doesn't know? Because he wasn't focusing on how it was unfolding. He was focusing on what he was doing. He wasn't focused on like, how is this unfolding? Are we going to win the game? He's like, what do we need to do in this possession? They just won the national championship with no scholarships, having ran through Duke University in the final. Number one team in the country. Or you're thinking, oh, they won the national championship. They must have thought we made it to the mountaintop. We must have this in control. He goes, no, there was zero point in this game where I thought we were in control. Or I thought we were at the mountaintop. Why? Because he's in the moment. Boom, right? See, how you do anything is how you do everything. Big games because it's the next one. So, Cruz, however your approach is going to be going into an at-bat, the first game of the year should probably look the same as the last game of the year. Granted, you might learn some things during the season that you change in your approach. But how you do anything is how you do everything. How you do anything is how you do everything. How you do anything is how you do everything. How I prepare, right? When I had a chance this year to speak at the National Baseball Coaches Convention, it's 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 probably the biggest accolade you can have as a mental game coach is to speak at the national baseball coaches convention in front of 5,000 baseball coaches. You can, and, and I'll, uh, I'll post a link to the video on here. If you guys want to watch it, it, I'm talking to coaches, but I think there'd be some benefit for you as players too. And th that morning, nobody knows this. Cause I, cause I go and hide and do it. Uh, but that morning I spoke at 10 at like eight 30, I go find an empty conference room at this hotel in Chicago. I shut the door. I lock the door and I get on stage and I open up my laptop and I prepare the same exact way as if I'm going to deliver that upstairs in front of 5,000 people. Separation is in preparation. So my mannerisms are the same. My energy is the same. My facial expressions are the same. My body language is the same. My tone, my volume is the same. I had somebody open up the door and peek their head in and I was in there getting after it by myself. And he's like, Oh, I thought there was a seminar here. I go, yeah, I'm just practicing. It was awesome. That was, that was a highlight for me when that happened. But again, gentlemen, how you do anything is how you do everything. So let me post that video here so you can see the link to that. Mm, let's see. Okay. All right, let's do this. As I'm finding that video and posting here, let me take you all through a mental imagery. It'll be the same thing that's in those audios, but I want to have a chance for us to experience it here together. So I'll do an abbreviated one, players, so we can get you out of here by 6.45, and then coaches will lock in until 7. Where I'm at. 
that's whatever time that is where you're at. Here we go. All right, go ahead and sit up straight in your chair, feet flat on the floor, hands on the lap in front of you. And I want you to, if, again, don't do this if you're driving, but I want you to get yourself in a good relaxed place. I want you to pick out a spot on the field of vision in front of you and focus on that spot, focus on that spot. And now let your eyes gently shut. As you inhale, breathing nice and deep through your nose for a count of six, hold for two, and then exhale for eight. In for six, hold for two, exhale for eight, one breath at a time. We talk about going through the baseball season one day at a time, competing one pitch at a time. Right now, just allow yourself to sink into this present moment one breath at a time. In through your nose for a count of six, hold for two, and then exhale for eight. And as you continue to focus on your breathing will help deepen the relaxation state by doing a quick body scan. So when you hear me say the number five, put your awareness into your toes, the balls of your feet, your arches, your ankles, your Achilles, your calves, your shins, as they release, relax, and let go. And with the number four, put that awareness into your knees, your quads, your hamstrings, your hips, your whole lower body. Just release, relax, and let go. And with the number three, put that awareness in your lower back, your mid back, your upper back, your abs, your obliques, your ribs, your chest, your whole torso. Just release, relax, and let go. And with the number two, put that awareness in your traps, shoulders, biceps, triceps, elbows, forearms, hands, and fingers. And with the number one, move that awareness up the back of your neck, the back of your head, your forehead, your eyes, your cheeks, your jaw, your lips gently part and the tongue just hangs in your mouth as a complete and total body relaxation and centering takes over. And what you'll realize is that the more relaxed you become, the better you might feel and the better you might feel, the more relaxed you might want to become. We're now going to transition into affirmation training. Please repeat the following statements to yourself. There's no need to say them out loud, but say them with confidence. Say them with that strong internal belief. We'll say each statement three times. I compete one pitch at a time. I compete one pitch at a time. I compete one pitch at a time. I'm in control of myself so I can control my performance. I'm in control of myself so I can control my performance. I'm in control of myself so I can control my performance. I play with confidence, energy, and a relaxed aggression. I play with confidence, energy, and a relaxed aggression. I play with confidence, energy, and a relaxed aggression. And now as you take another full deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth, I want you to go back and replay, recall a moment in time when you were at your very best. Replaying those experiences of what it was like in the movie theater of your mind, whether you see it internal as if you're in the moment, in the box, on the mound, external as if you're watching it on TV. But put yourself back in those moments when you were playing your absolute best. See what it looked like. Hear what it sounded like. Feel what it felt like. If you can smell the smells and taste the state, taste the tastes, 
Use all the senses that you have to make those moments as real as you possibly can. As you re recall and reflect and look back at these best performances, notice what your body language was like. Notice what your effort level was like. What your energy was like. And make those images more rich, more clear, more vivid as I count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And as you take another full deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth, I want you to now look ahead at your next baseball performance. Put yourself on that field in that next performance and experience yourself competing with confidence, competing with energy, competing with an edge, being at your very best. Notice what it looks like. what it feels like, what it sounds like. Being dialed in, being locked in, and being at your very best. Now, as we count from 10 to zero, make those images in your mind as rich, as clear, and vivid as you possibly can. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Now, as you take another full deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth, just go ahead and open up your eyes and bring yourself back to this room right here right now as this concludes our baseball softball mental imagery awesome players thanks for being here kept you all a little bit late tonight good just posted a link to that video we talked about when i spoke at the abca you can find a link to that there if you want to take a look uh players we'll catch you next week we're gonna be talking about routines and habits of excellence pillar seven be on the lookout for your video coming out tomorrow in our worksheet so you can study and prepare for that call and obviously uh players as you're going through this season Anytime you have questions that you want to ask, uh, probably the best place to put those is a direct message on Instagram at Brian Kane Peak. I'll put those here. Or if you want to send me an email, if that's easier, briankane.com slash contact. And then what I'll most likely do is make a video uh, with an answer to that and post it on my YouTube channel and send that to you as a direct link so you can see that answer. Awesome. Players, thanks for being here. You guys are out again. You're always welcome to stay. If you want to be a coach and hang, you can. Coaches, let's uh, talk about some mental imagery and how we build this into our program. So, uh, thank you, coach. Thank you. I'm Appreciate sorry, you being here. Thanks for being here. Let's go to Coach Andrews. Coach Andrews, if you would, uh, talk to me about mental imagery, Porter's Northern. What are some of the things that you guys do to work on that there at your program? Yeah, I, I would say that this is becoming something a little more new for us, but we have already sent out those links to the. Uh, hitting and pitching imagery looking forward to you know going through the team one as well with our players um but we we've started that we've been doing the shadow bullpens we've been doing the uh green red yellow plates so those are the main things uh we've been doing uh my staff and i were talking about um you know whether we're starting a practice with a quick uh visualization meditation uh, so we're still kind of in the planning phases, how we can implement this stuff a little bit more. But, um, you know, after working with you last year with this stuff, we, we've already kind of been diving in this off season with some of those things. Yeah. I mean, I think shadow bullpens, the mental at bats in a game, right. An easy trigger for mental at bats is if you're not in the starting lineup on the lineup card on the wall, 
your niche, your, your number or your name is next to the person who you're taking a mental app out with. So as a coach and Jim Slosnagel at TCU now at AM is one of the best in the country at this is they would literally put a throw down plate like that game. You saw Wichita state versus TCU. That player is at a throw down plate in the dugout saying, this is the mental app bat station. So when, when you, the person who's position that you play, who's is at home plate, you come to this home plate and take your mental app bat. So if you understand behavior design, like if you've been going through the books on habits and optimize where they always say trigger kickstarts the behavior, right? Or trigger kickstarts what it is I'm going to do for my routine. Well, the trigger is if I'm playing center field, when the center fielder comes to home plate and I'm not in the lineup, I take my at bat when he does trigger for shadow bullpens. Kirk Sarlos did this at TCU. He's the only guy I see do it at this time. And I think it's the best time is during a game. He'll send two pitchers to the, do the shadow bullpen in the first inning during the game. Two other guys go in the second, two other guys go in the third, two other guys will go down in the fourth. And what they do is they watch what happens in the game. And if the guy spikes a fastball, they spike a fastball in the dug in the, in the shadow bullpen. If they get a strike three swing and miss, that's what they do in the shadow bullpen. So the shadow bullpen is dictated by what happens in the game. Other triggers I would see college baseball teams the night before a game would get together, you know, in a hotel. And I don't know how much you guys travel to, to in hotels. I don't think a ton in high school, but I know we've got some teams that are here coming to the Boris classic in Arizona here coming up pretty soon. And they'll stay in a hotel and every night in that hotel, instead of doing a bed check, I would say bed check is in the conference room, go through your bathroom routine before you come down, grab a pillow. And when they come down, we do mental imagery together. And I'll show you kind of what this looks like. Cause when I travel with a college team and I know we've got, you know, some up and coming mental performance coaches on here that are going to be doing this too. Let me show you. So here is a, hang on. Let me mute all you guys. Not sure why we're getting audio here. And let's see, people cannot unmute themselves. So I'll have to give you access there. All right, so if we come here and take a look, uh, that's my picture on Ole Miss, good. Let's take a look at that real quick. How about that? Look at that. Wow, what is that from? No beard, bro. Old school, good. But if we take a look inside of college baseball's top baseball program in the mental game at Ole Miss, and again, I think I've posted this in the chat before, but we'll post it again. If you scroll down, here's you're going to see how, okay, this is what Brian does when he goes with Ole Miss. And some of the things that we've implemented from a team building standpoint, or some of the stuff that we've implemented uh, with mental at bats. So let's take a look at mental at bats, then we'll look at mental imagery. You know, another thing that you'll see the old Miss hitters do in the dugout is grab their batting gloves, grab their bat, and actually go through a mental at bat in the dugout where they watch the pitcher throw and then visualize themselves hitting off of that pitcher so that when they get a chance to play later on in that series or in that game, they feel like they've been in the pace of the game more and are more prepared to hit. Also, they're using mental imagery, which the brain does not tell the difference between what you vividly imagine and what you physically experience. It's processed the same way. So they're actually hardwiring themselves for peak performance by taking those mental at-bats in the dugout. All right, so here's another clip here talking about mental imagery. You know, we talked about doing mental imagery in the dugout using those mental at-bats. Also in the hotel, the night before the game, every night we'll lay down on the ground, take the players through the four steps of mental imagery. The first thing I want you to do is as you're laying there, is just put your hands on your stomach. It's funny how this is like 15 years ago and we're doing the same thing, man. The process is the process. It's been around long before I was here or you were here and it's gonna be here long after we're gone. Gently close your eyes, and focus on your breathing. Number one, relaxation. Number two, confidence conditioning. Number three, mental recall. And number four, mental rehearsal. We have them come down to the hotel conference room and go through mental imagery to help them mentally prepare for success in tomorrow's performance. By visualizing themselves playing at their best, they increase their chances of playing that way. And when you can see, feel, and hear your performance being at your best, just take one more good deep breath. As you exhale, open up your eyes and bring yourself right back to this room, right here, right now. Now, if you're a baseball player and you want to oh, hit there you go. So you have pitching you have those imagery audios, right? And that's going to be an example, I think, of something that you can use with your team. So Chris Andrews, thanks for being with us here, man. We're going to open it up to uh, 
to other questions here. We've got one in the chat. So let's see. Comes in from Dale. What mental performance strategies do you like to use immediately after a game, post game, coach talk, et cetera? Really good. Let me open that up, uh, Coach Andrews. Let's come back to you. Post game talk. What are you doing there at Portage Northern? And I got kind of my idea. I want to hear what some of you guys are doing. What do you? What's your thoughts on uh, post game talks? Yeah. So I I have gotten a lot shorter with talks over the years. Um, you know, I, I I often tell the guys that you know, we'll use uh, tomorrow's practice to reflect and talk about the game. Um, but, you know, one thing I, I, I might often say to our players that would go or be in line with this is, you know, hey, go back, replay uh, what went well, you know, what you could have done better, and then start formulating a plan on, on, on how you can do that. And I think sometimes when you you go back and replay the game, you know, that's a, a, a form of that imagery, you know, you're going back and seeing and feeling how it went. And then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about putting a plan together. And that's what I tell the players, you know, I'll, I'll meet with the coaches and we'll do a well, better how and put together a plan for the next day. Yeah. I mean, I, that's awesome. I've seen, I've seen, you know, the gamut, right. I've seen like coaches that literally national championship winning coaches uh, take their team in the outfield after a game, it's 10 o'clock at night. It's like 40 degrees, Southern California, early in the year, you know, and, and literally be in the outfield for, kid you not, almost two hours talking to their team. And this is a guy that's won a national championship. He's a very successful Division One college coach. And I'm sitting there going, this is about him. He's frustrated. His kids want to get out of there. It's 10 o'clock at night. They got no interest in being there. They just got their tail kicked. They want to go home. They want to go eat. They want to get after it the next day. They don't want to get out of there. And then I've seen the other end of the spectrum, a college coach who, when the game's over, he says this to his team. And this is the, this is the way I lean. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying this is the way I lean. Is after the game, they go shake hands with the other team. And he says, look, your families are here. Go see your families. The game's over. Anything that I got to share with you about our performance, we'll do tomorrow. So instead of him spending a half an hour after the game, breaking it down, he gets them out of there. Doesn't even tell them, Hey, see you guys tomorrow at this time. Like he has them on a calendar. They know what time to go there. They look at it. They don't need to talk to him or he doesn't need to remind them. They can look at the process on their phone, on their Google calendar to go. This is when I got to be there. They show up 15 minutes early. They break down the game. He takes time to look at the video. He doesn't get as emotional. He has more time to go through and get a more accurate breakdown. Those are the two extremes. The thing I think that's, that's, that is, most common practice, as Coach Andrews alluded to, is after the game, shake hands, meet you in the outfield, and you have an assistant coach start a stopwatch. No more than three minutes. And you might go through and do a well, a better, a how. You might go through and say, hey, guys, here's, here's what I like. Jim Slosnagel in AM does it this way. He'll praise them for things that he, that he thought that he liked in the game. And the only time they'll meet for more than two minutes or so is if there's something he needs to correct around attitude, behavior, or a controllable. When he and other coaches I work with have the longest team meetings in the outfield is when they're really frustrated because their team did not control the things that they could control. Not necessarily when they lose. Sometimes they'll get after their team when they win because they didn't play well. They didn't do the things they needed. They didn't execute the controllables. So I think the key, the key thing is make sure it's not you losing control of yourself and feeling better about yourself because you're emotional uh, and you need to get it off of your chest. Like just because you need to get it off your chest, you might be the problem. Maybe not your team, right? You might not have prepared them the right way. You might have not had the right game plan. You might have not made the right decisions. So before you start jumping the team, just think about the, what you did. And I think you have your whole team say, we're going to be better off. If everyone gets some space, we come back in tomorrow and we start our next team meeting and practice with a well, better how I looking back yesterday, what do we do? Well, and now you can look at the stats and you can go, man, we, we got the lead off hitter out in five out of seven innings. That's pretty good. Right. We, we did not, we won the free base war. We took two hit by pitches and we lost three to two. So, guys, we played pretty well. If we played them again and we won the free base war, we got five out of seven leadoff hitters out, we took two hit by pitch, we're probably winning that game. But this is baseball. And just because you run the process the right way doesn't guarantee you to win. It just guarantees you the best chance for success. So I think taking some time and distance away from the end of the game to give you more clear reflection is going to be good. Um, 
thing. Yeah, right? yeah, come on, come on. Yeah, extreme ownership by Jocko Willing. I mean, that that changed my perspective as a coach. Um, when when my team doesn't perform well, the first thing I'm going to tell them is, guys, that's on me. You know, where I used to be, like you guys didn't play well. You know, and blame, blame, blame. And you know, as the coach of the team, it's on me to get the guys to uh, perform well, play well. And so I think the players appreciate that. I actually feel like they, they then take ownership. Like, no, nah, coach, it's, we, we didn't do what we should have done. And, and I say, well, look, but I'm going to come up with a plan that is going to hold you accountable to doing, you know, that I can hold you accountable to that maybe will help you perform better. But anyways, just, you know, real quick, that that's something I think that that's helped me as a coach. Um, don't blame your team. Take a look yeah. at yourself. Yeah, for sure. And it's not always easy to do, but it's always easier to do. I think the more time and space you get away from the game. Yeah. You know, because you have more accurate reflection because when you're a competitor, you get emotional. When you're a competitor, you get caught up in the game and and there'll be some times where like you want to talk about something right away because it's egregious and your team wasn't into it or you need to ask questions of your staff right there in the moment and you want to stay in it so that you, when you leave, you can leave it behind. Like you just have to ask yourself, what do you think is going to be best for you and your staff? I think there isn't one way to do it. You just got to find out what your way to do it is and then be consistent with your way. And on that note, I want to be respectful of y'all's time. If you didn't get a chance to check out the Sean Casey Coaching Matters video tonight, we'll make sure we send that to you when we send the link to next week's call too. It was tremendous, really good. So thanks for being here.